Welcome to American Pulse. النهاردة احنا جايين لكم من واشنطن دي سي العاصمة الأمريكية وتحديدا مجلس الشيوخ في مجلس النواب الكونجرس الأمريكي. النبض الأمريكي قام بتحضير لمؤتمر إدراج الجماعة الإخوان المسلمين كجماعة إرهابية في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بالتعاون مع مركز لندن للأبحاث الاستراتيجية والسياسية. المؤتمر دوت جاي في توقيت مهم جدا لأن في قانون في في مجلس النواب بيتوافق عليه دلوقتي لادراج هذه الجماعه كجماعه ارهابيه وكان من الواجب ان احنا ندي لهم خبرتنا كمصريين ازاي تعاملنا مع هذا التنظيم الارهابي وفي نفس الوقت من الواضح ان في هجوم كبير على الجماعات الارهابيه من دبل من من الغرب بعد ما الاحداث الاخيره في في تفجيرات اورلاندو في فرنسا فالحقيقه الناس العالم ابتدى يفهم دلوقتي مدى خطوره هذا التنظيم الارهابي يلا تعالوا معانا نشوف ايه اللي حصل في المؤتمر ونتكلم عن خبرتنا مع الاخوان المسلمين في مصر Uh, I'm going to move to the other side of the table now. I'm very, I'm pleased that we have with us uh, Mahmoud Kabil. Uh, he's an award-winning uh, Egyptian actor. Uh, spends time uh, both uh, here in the States and in Egypt. He's also the UNICEF's goodwill uh, ambassador to the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, too bad that uh, Congressman Gomert left too bad. Um, I was going to ask him a question. Um, back in 67, I was uh, in the reconnaissance troops of the Egyptian army, and I saved my, the life of my enemy, uh, Captain Yair Barak. Uh, who was downed in, in a parachute and I captured him in uh, in the desert of Sinai and I saved his life and now we're best friends. Does um, that make me, and I'm a Muslim and I believe in Islam. Uh, so when someone without, you know, intention called my religion radical Islam, why, why generalize? I think he was just talking about the radical. No, uh, well, well, that's it. That's it. In order to gain, in order to gain, and this is a message, in order to gain all Muslims in our fight against terrorism, in order to gain everybody, all the Muslims that are here in the States or all around the world, don't call their religion radical. Because when you generalize, they would answer you. Should we call Hitler and all his cabinet were Catholics by the, that Catholicism, there is a, a, a thing called um, radical Catholicism or radical Christianism? Why generalize? I'm here today. I flew from Berkeley, California. And I just had a, a four-time hip surgery, total change. Uh, and I came, it's been only uh, maybe 10 weeks. I'm not supposed to be here. My doctor said, you know, there is a thing. But I came here to take part in branding the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. And not only the Muslim Brotherhood, but also its affiliate that already has been called Muslim uh, 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 terrorist organization, Hamas. And I don't know how people here don't make the difference. Hamas is a Muslim brotherhood. The, the founder of Hamas is a part of the Muslim brotherhood. So most Muslims are against a terrorism. All the victims that we see in Egypt, you have to, you know, and unfortunately here the media is not mentioning that. Uh, are all um, uh, Egyptian soldiers. They're all Muslims. They're fighting terrorism. Uh, 
uh, everywhere in the Muslim countries, like, you know, in Iraq lately or in Turkey or in Syria, that's Muslims against Muslims. So you alienate, and this is coming from a Muslim, you alienate uh, moderate, if I say moderate Muslim or the, 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 the majority of Muslims when you, t you call their religion radical. I just wanted to make that point. But also, I want to thank, you know, uh, uh, Congressman Gomert that he, he said at the end, we don't have a problem with Muslims. Uh, uh, we have a problem with radical Muslims. Why not say that? Radical Muslims, not radical Islam. And uh, I believe in order to protect this nation that is so dear to all of us, is not to use labels, not to label uh, a majority, a, a, a big religion of uh, over uh, almost two billion people, and uh, uh, consider the, the, the terrorism that is uh, uh, perpetrated by a minority of people uh, and generalize the whole thing and call the religion of the, the remainder that it's radical. Uh, I know that people say, no, no, we're talking about radical Muslim, not good Muslim. There is no radical. You're talking about radical Islam. This Islam is a religion. Islam means surrendering. And I think that, you know, uh, people, and I already give that message to uh, people uh, from the State Department, because I was there during the revolution. I took um, an active part in Medan al-Tahrir. I was there with the youngsters. We were there. After that, I was there. Uh, I was the head of the veterans against Morsi and against the, brother, uh, the Brotherhood. We were training young people. And we took part in getting rid of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in, uh, in, in, um, in June uh, 2013. So, I felt everybody was there. Uh, I talked to to to, uh, to people in the State Department. That time it was uh, before it, it was Margaret Scobie, Ambassador Margaret Scobie, uh, until June, and then after June it was um, Anne Patterson. And I told these people, I told them, guys, you didn't, you didn't do your homework. I mean, you have to understand that the roots of Muslim Brotherhood, that the motherhood, the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood is the mother load of all terrorism around the world. Just read Sayyid Qutb. Read Sayyid Qutb what he's saying. This is exactly the Wahhabi belief in to not accepting anybody else that is not, that don't have your beliefs. And this is not Islam. And it's not because under the Bush administration that some of the youngsters and the approach that were made by Muslim Brotherhood uh, through uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Saad uh, al-Din Ibrahim uh, they were saying, telling me from the city department but they're modern people, they're, they're liberal they're not liberal a Muslim Brotherhood member would tell you anything he will tell you that maybe he's, he's a communist or he's a, a, a capitalist, anything, to just get to his, to what they want. So this is why I, I really, uh, I'm sorry that I made in the first, you know, uh, <laughs> introduction, I made that difference, uh, that uh, semantics about uh, radical Islam and uh, radical Muslims, but um, I'll do anything, you know, to help and to give any data or whatever details about that period where we had the Muslim Brotherhood and how to get, how we got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in order to label that organization that it is a terrorist organization. This is a terrorist organization. This is the mother load of terrorism around the world. This is the mother of ISIS. And, and we allow people from the Muslim Brotherhood to go to the University of California, Berkeley, and give a lecture to American people. And thank God I was there to attend to correct what they said and telling them, you know what? The origin 
of terrorism is Sisi. And uh, the fact is that if you read Sisi from the other way around, it's ISIS. So this is the roots of terrorism. How can you be so <laughs> and allow people like that to go and give lecture in Berkeley, California? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, points there. Um, well, we're going to stop and ask. A few we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to take questions at the end because everybody has a schedule. So we're going to take questions at the end. And uh, as I said before, for the members of Congress, I'm going to say the same thing here as well. And that is, um, if we run out of time, uh, please feel free to email it to us, and we'll certainly get an answer. Uh, from whomever you're, the question is posed to. Um, our next uh, panelist is uh, Samantha Leahy. Unfortunately, with, with everything that's going on in Dallas, te in, in, in Texas uh, right now, uh, the senator was unable to join us. Uh, but uh, Samantha is uh, uh, one of the senator's uh, senior uh, foreign policy uh, staffers. And uh, all yours. Hi. Uh, I just want to review the Muslim Brotherhood Terrorist Designation Act with you. It is S-2230 in the Senate. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz has introduced it with Representatives Mario diaz Bilar and Representative Gomer. It urges the Secretary of State to designate the Brotherhood as a foreign terrorist organization under Section 219 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. The Muslim Brotherhood well, the United States has officially listed individual members, branches, and charities of the Brotherhood as terrorists, but has not designated the organization as a whole. So this bill recognizes the simple fact that the Brotherhood is a radical Islamic terrorist group. They pose a direct threat to the national security of the United States as they've outlined their strategic goals for the North for North America, mainly their process known as civilization jihad. That is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers." Their quote. U.S. officials have even testified that the Muslim Brotherhood, both in the United States and overseas, has supported terrorism by leveraging U.S. financial institutions and resources for their own campaign. Richard Clark, a former counterterrorism official under Bush and Clinton, said, the common link here is the extremist Muslim Brotherhood. All of these organizations, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Al-Qaeda, are descendants of the membership and ideology of the Muslim Brothers. So we need to stop and we need to reject the fantasy that this is a parent institution and it's not a political entity. This is a common sense step. We need to stand with our allies like Egypt, the UAE, even Saudi Arabia and Russia have designated the Brotherhood as an organization. So this is a reality check and we need to stay up to date with this threat. Thank you, Samantha. And I also want to thank uh, Senator uh, Cruz, um, and you can pass this along for, uh, for actually hosting us today and hosting us in this room as well. Um, I want to, we're just moving on quickly. I know that um, well, we will have time for questions and I'm sure that we'll have time for everybody here to participate in those as well. Um, uh, London's, uh, London Center Senior Military Fellow, uh, Major General Bob Newman is here. He's in the, uh, and uh, Bob was a uh, former Adjutant General of Virginia National Guard, and I thought it would be uh, a, a good addition to this uh, discussion to focus on homeland issues. Thanks, Ellie. Um, as Adjutant General, <clears throat> I commanded uh, in Virginia was 10,000 airmen and soldiers whose uh, duties included homeland defense of the Commonwealth. Uh, part of the concern I've had is the uh, terrorist threat continues to grow from inside the United States is the, uh, the stealth tactics that they use to co uh, cloak their true methodology. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in the past has, uh, has worn many cloaks, a chameleon if you will, has changed color to suit its, uh, its environment. For example, if you were in um, 
if you were in uh, uh, Jordan, for example, then they would be uh, a collaborative organization. If you were uh, in Egypt, and correct me if I'm wrong there, you know, then you would be uh, a, a not opponent, but a pacifist type yeah, of opponent, you know, one that, that doesn't yeah. uh, doesn't harm the society. And then if you were in uh, perhaps Syria or Libya, one of the more conflictive states, then you would be an open uh, opponent of, uh, of the government there. Uh, that is a real threat to our country, and it threatens uh, the regime which, in which I worked, which is the states. <clears throat> Many of you know from personal experience and either having experienced a disaster, a natural disaster such as a hurricane or a flood, or perhaps those of you that live here in Washington uh, underwent the trials of 9-11 when uh, traffic came to a stop and, and quite often uh, lives were disrupted. Well, the National Guard plays a vital role in continuing society. Uh, everything from logistical support to, uh, to hospitals, to uh, communication centers, to government itself, to uh, providing military uh, support to uh, authorities to protect uh, the national interests. The Guard has a role to play. And in the United States, as the Brotherhood continues to assimilate into society, to become part of the fabric of America, to show that we are here to, to be friends, to to change our, our skin, so to speak, so that we will be looked at as a peaceful organization, it poses a real threat. Uh, my real concern happens to be not from a, an attack from a Muslim Brotherhood that would be a kinetic type of attack, one that would use military tactics, military weapons to attack our structure, but non-kinetic forces, things such as cyber attacks, things such as EMPs, electronic magnetic pulse, where you can disrupt an electric grid by, um, by high electromagnetic currents to certain areas, uh, biological warfare, things such as this that pose a threat that uh, could be developed from within society from unsuspected locations, whether it's a mosque or a local gathering of, uh, of folks uh, seemingly with no mal intent to the American population. I'm concerned that the Brotherhood and terrorist organizations like it, assimilating in the fabric of our country, will, uh, will pose a real threat through non-kinetic means. And uh, that is an issue, I think, that has been unaddressed, but one that we should focus on. Final uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Michael Morgan. Uh, Michael has a, uh, a, a radio, a television program in Egypt. is one of the largest, uh, or the largest, uh, pro-American uh, television program uh, in Egypt. Uh, has 1.5 million uh, viewers or so. Actually, a lot more. Four oh. million in the Middle East. Oh well, there you go. So I stand corrected, uh, yeah. Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for everybody that is in the room that made the time to come in, uh, our elite audience. Uh, thanks for the London Center to put this together. I special thanks for Senator Ted Cruz's office uh, to allow us to be here. And uh, we're sorry that he couldn't make it, but uh, you know he had sent somebody on, on his behalf, which was great. Um, um, I would like also to especially thank uh, Eddie Gold because him and I have been trying to put this together for like six months now, nonstop work. Herb London has been a great support, so uh, um, let's start with that. Um, I would like to um, talk about why I'm interested in this particular uh, subject. I had come to the United States 17 years ago. I had pretty much hundred dollars on me. I came in for a better opportunity. I started my life from scratch and I don't wanna talk too much about where what happened, but I, I feel very, very loyal to my home country, Egypt, and very, very loyal and appreciative to the United States that had given me the chance to become who I am today, despite all the bumps that were happening uh, to get me to where I am now. I started American Pulse TV show just to bridge the gap between the two governments uh, over the last four years between the Egyptian government and the American, current American administration that has clearly showed a lot of support to the Muslim Brotherhood who we declared or my original country had declared in Egypt uh, as a terror group. And uh, I'm not an attorney by uh, profession, but I'd like to build my case, so, and I'm sorry, uh, Ellie, if I'm going to take a little more than what I should, but uh, uh, one more minute. Um, uh, it just, uh, I, I'd like to build the case because we have to check the pattern of, of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
uh, Muslim Brotherhood, they started after the destruction or the, uh, the um, dissolving of the Caliphate in Turkey in 1925 by Mustafa Kemal uh, <coughs> Atatürk. And Hassan al-Banna, which is an Egyptian guy, has started in 1928, exactly in March, uh, to build this organization. And the reason I'm going back is just because we need to know how they started, how they function, and so we can expect and detect what they're going to do next. So few things, uh, the, the, their plan usually, he, he wanted to start this organization on three generations. So he said, I have no problem with the first generation not to do anything. I just want people to listen to me. So he used to go out, go in coffee shops, go to restaurants, meet people at their homes, and just start talking to them and trying to implement. And, and I'm you know, not defending the congressman, but he, you know, I think the congressman meant the, the Islamic extremist, not the, the radical Islam as a religion. He's, he's talking about the, the people, not the religion. Why so, don't you say it? Well, he, he's not here now. So, <laughs> so no, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that's what he meant. So, so basically, this is the first stage. The second stage was the execution or trying to get a plan together and get people to execute the plan. So this happened in 1948, and I'm sorry if I'm going to be a little boring with the dates, but it shows how they function. So what they did is they used them for the war, and then they started going against the British and the American embassy, and they wanted to bomb it. So the judge, uh, Al Khazandar, he decided to imprison two of their guys because they were convicted of trying to bomb English stores and cafes and stuff like that. And so they decided to kill him. And not just to take a revenge because they imprisoned two people. And this is what I'm thinking. They, imp he imp they killed him because they wanted to send a message to all the judges for the future. You, 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 you play with us, we kill you. You imprison us, we kill you. So the terror was like a, a, a very fundamental part of their strategy. They just trying, they just trying to terrorize everybody. And, it, and I think that's what they have been doing. So after that, they started getting close to Nukrashi Basha, which is the prime minister. And then he found them that they also doing bombings and he found weapons and everything. So he decided to dissolve for the first time and dismantle the organization. So first they come close to the power and then they go against it. That happened the first time. Second time happened with Nasser in 1952. They hijacked the revolution. They tried to help him out. He was their friend. He was part of the group. And then when he didn't give them enough piece of the cake, they went against him. So they tried to kill him in 1954 when he gave that his, fam his, his famous speech in Manchea. So, so again, they became close to him and then they trying to kill him. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build a pattern here. So they go with Sadat. Sadat wanted somebody to back him up against Nasser in, in, in 1970s. So he, they go close to Sadat, they support him, <clears throat> and the minute that he turned all over them and put him in jail, they killed him. So, so why wouldn't they do the same thing to the U.S.? This is the point what I'm trying to get. Why this is the pattern has been repeating itself at least five times. They clearly do, and exactly like Mr. Mahmoud Kabil said, they'll tell you anything. They'll tell you I'm a communist. They'll tell you I'm Jew. I'm, I'm Christian. I'm anything. Whatever you want to hear it. They come, I couldn't even believe it. They're supporting the gay rights where in their books, the Islam is against uh, homosexuality. All the books. All the books. So, I mean, you know, not them, you know, you know what I mean? Like they'll just go against their beliefs just to get to where they want to go. So I urge the Americans to rise and to be aware because that it comes to the point where it's too late to save this country. That's it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I, it was, it was uh, re requested by our panelists that the questions just be asked. So. Um, Michael is going to have a, uh, I think, a, a, a mic to, to walk around with, um, and uh, well, you're up, you're up front. We can, I guess, we'll ask your question. Yeah, just one second. I'm sorry. So we'll just. Uh, yeah. Yep. Can you? Yes, please, and identify yourself, please. My name is Richard Douglas. Um, 
I guess the only thing relevant here is I'm an Iraq veteran and uh, spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and Pakistan too. And I wanted to say uh, thank you for these heartfelt comments, Mahmoud. It was really a pleasure to hear you and thank you for rescuing you, Barack. But um, I would like it if the panel could talk a little bit, please, about Turkey and about Iran post-agreement. Uh -huh. Uh, I think one of the uh, most disastric, disastrous foreign policy decisions was the move to allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. And I say allow very carefully because if, you, if Iran were to comply with the agreement, they would have nuclear weapons in roughly 10 years. But that means they would have to comply. We already see violations that have occurred. So the likelihood is they'll have nuclear weapons sooner. This has been permitted. You see the violations, and there is no snapback. So despite all the assurances that were given to the United States and to people in this country, there is no snapback. As a consequence, Iran has a virtually free run about its future and its nuclear future, which is devastating to the area. The tilt to Iran was based on the proposition that Iran would be the stabilizing influence in the Middle East. It would counter the Sunni uh, control over large parts of the territory and its influence, and this minority, the roughly 15% of the uh, Shia population, would be the counterweight to whatever the Sunnis were doing. It's a misguided theory, it's a misguided proposition, and it's been misguided in application. Now, as far as Turkey is concerned, Erdogan, in my judgment, is a kind of political schizophrenic. He has one foot in the moderate camp, that is NATO, and he has one foot in the radical camp. And what we have to do is to either say to him, either you're with us in NATO or you're not. And if you're not, then you don't belong in NATO. There are obvious advantages for Erdogan to remain in NATO, but at the same time, he plays a very dangerous game. He has been buying oil from ISIS and at the same time says he's fighting ISIS. So it's not at all clear what Turkey will do in the future. Turkey has a very powerful air force and a very powerful military apparatus that could be used effectively in the wars in the Middle East. But the problem is, it's not clear whether in fact they're an ally or not an ally. There's a lot more I could say about that, but I don't want to dominate the time here. Turkey? If anybody has an answer. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I'm interested in the Turkey part, but I'll go after uh, Mr. Kabil. Well, uh, Erdogan. <laughs> oh, okay who, who uh, claimed to be an ally of uh, the United States of America and member of the NATO and wants to be part of uh, Europe Uni hasn't delivered what he should. Erdogan is one of the main champion of the Muslim Brotherhood. Erdogan is calling Sisi a murderer because what happened in Rabah al Adawiyah, the stand up in Rabah al Adawiyah, which is uh, any in any country, if people go to Madison Square and occupy Madison Square and say this is our uh, uh, our part of the country and because we believed in uh, whatever, I think the mayor of uh, New York will call the National Guard to help him get rid of these people. And obviously, because of, you know, everybody has the right to have a gun here, it's going to be <laughs> a catastrophe. They would have... And this is what happened in Egypt. This is what happened in Egypt. Uh, they, they've been warned, the Muslim Brotherhood were warned, warned to leave that part, go out, children and women, please go out. And they did not. The leadership left them and left innocent people get killed. I disagree, and I don't believe I I, I disagree in killing an innocent soul or any soul. I disagree with crime. But you know, these are the result of miscalculation. And that miscalculation was done by the Muslim Brotherhood leadership at that time. So Erdogan now when we look at the, the map, you have Iran, you have Turkey, you have Saudi Arabia uh, uh, trying to have uh, uh, an axis 
who either with Iran and the Emirates and all these people against uh, with the Turkey and Turkey is now flirting with Iran. So the responsible for all that is Erdogan. And uh, I don't think that Erdogan is a real uh, friend of the West. Erdogan wants to have his uh, agenda, uh, which is the Muslim Caliphate, like uh, Michael uh, mentioned, he has the same agenda of uh, Hassan al-Banna. So this is Erdogan. Thank you. Mm. Um, I see a hand in the back. Uh, Ken Abramowitz here. Uh, since we're designating uh, terror organizations today, uh, should uh, study Wahhabis uh, be considered a terror organization for the um, intellectual control over a lot of mosques throughout America and uh, Europe and the world? Did you have a question? Well, I don't want to dominate it. If someone else wants to take it, I, then Ken, thank you for the question. Um, I didn't hear the question. Uh, Michael, let, 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 Michael, Michael, go ahead. Go ahead, Tarb, if you want. Okay. I didn't hear well, the question. He's, can you, uh, he's saying that, I, I, I yeah, think can, if you, if I get this right, he's, he's asking whether, since we're lab labeling certain groups today as terrorist group and uh, classifying them as a terror group, then Saudi Wahhabi should be part of these groups uh, since they control mosques, he said? Definitely, I agree with you, sir. Definitely. Wahhabism is, is uh, coming from Ibn Taymiyyah, and the Wahhabism is the mother load also of the Muslim Brotherhood, who is the mother load of terrorism, international terrorism. Uh, Wahhabism is, uh, is now turning against the Al Saud, who are Wahhabis also, but you know, they're turning <laughs> against them now, and they want. Bin Laden is one of the examples that I can give you. He's a Wahhabi, and he wanted to get rid of the Al Saud. So uh, uh, let's forget about the Al Saud now because they have interests with the United States. But you know, it's who is with uh, behind all the terrorism are Wahhabi families in Saudi Arabia, in uh, other country, Arabic countries that are financing these terrorist organizations until now. And I think we have to point out that and, 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 and to take, uh, uh, just to label not only the Muslim Brotherhood, but the people financing all these terrorist organizations. That should be labeled too. I really believe, uh, to top it off, I really believe that we should label any group as a terror group today and any time in the future, whoever allows anybody else to take somebody's soul that does not belong to them. So if any group preaches killing, any group preaches terrorizing people, they are a terror group. So I don't care where they're coming from, I don't care where they are. I think nobody has the right to take anybody else's life. Ken, you, you raise a point, however, about the influence of Wahhabism in mosques in the United States. And that is profound, largely because they have exported the Wahhabist beliefs to mosques everywhere in this country. And so that is a danger. When I said before, that we are engaged in a doc doctrinal war and we have to understand the nature of the enemy. Part of it is understanding what is happening and the large majority of mosques in the United States where in fact Wahhabism has penetrated those organizations. And so you need a counter view, a counter narrative that I think is necessary. That's what I was getting at when I said the tactics that have to be employed in the future. Dustin. Hi, Dustin Stockton, uh, Breitbart News. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of, of good reasons why we should name the Muslim Brotherhood a ter terrorist organization, but I was hoping the panel could expound on what the official classification would do to the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, operational and financial uh, ability to move forward. Samantha? So designating the Muslim Brotherhood would in effect give State Department more leeway in order to open up investigations into the financial routes that they are utilizing overseas and how they are getting into the US. So 
with each designation, there needs to be certain thresholds that are met, such as it needs to be a foreign organization, it needs to be engaging in terrorist activity, which is a host of different things, such as material support. And it also needs to threaten the security of the United States nationals. So the argument against designating the Brotherhood is that people don't believe it's a threat to US nationals. And what they're not fully understanding is again what Herb just said, the nature of this group to destroy Western civilization from within. And so they are posing as charities. They're posing as educational institutions, and that is something that our government is not currently looking at. And so that's why this designation is needed. Uh, I'm, I'm here. Thank you very much, Ellie. This is a question about doctrine. It's a question about economic mobility. What is the Arab League doing about this? Because essentially, it's about perception. The big question is, from your perspective, what has been allocated from the Arab League to change the perception of radical Islam or radical Muslims? I think the Arab League should do something about it. But the Arab League is mostly financed by uh, petrodollars. And if you're financed by petrodollars, then you're financed by Wahhabis. And if you're financed by Wahhabis, the Arab League will never condemn the Muslim Brotherhood. They will be neutral, and that's a shame. I think, I think um, you know, as President Sisi and uh, uh, Dr. Herb London had mentioned that he stood there in Al-Azhar and, uh, and he took, uh, gave the speech to the Imams, uh, I think the, the fi fixing the problem has to come from within. Mm -hmm. I, I really think what we're doing today is great and you know, we should do more of these events because we need to expose the ideology and the minister Samah Shukri had spoken in to uh, the U uh, United, uh, United Nations uh, back in May when Egypt was the president of the Security Council and it was for the first time an Egyptian Muslim leader, minister, saying that we have a problem together with Sisi. They said we have a problem. And I think the beginning of fixing the problem is to realize that we have a problem. So I think fighting ideology is very, very important. I think exposing the issue is very important. I think talking about it and trying to educate people with the proper Islam and proper religion and overall the humanity, like everybody has to respect everybody else. We all, there's no way 1.3 billion, billion people like Sisi said that will convert 7 billion people to Islam. It's never gonna happen. Thank you. I know that uh, we're running out of time, or we ran out of time, actually, because uh, I know that uh, our panelists have to catch trains and get back to work and so on. But I do want to thank... Uh, Josh had a question. Uh, no. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Josh, go ahead. Um, Josh London, uh, Zionist Organization of America. It's actually just a, a quick question as a follow-up uh, on the legislative component. Um, I just had a curiosity when when you indicated that um, the uh, having the designation would give leeway to the State Department, given the current State Department um, and the foreseeable one, uh, uh, perhaps. Um, I'm curious: is there any uh, non? Um, but is there any obligatory action that has to take place um, in context of if the Muslim Brotherhood becomes an FTO? For example, money we give to the Palestinian Authority, there's triggers if Hamas gets in because Hamas is designated. Is there anything like that currently standing for general FTOs that would force the State Department to do something? Yes. One of the biggest restrictions is a ban on coming into the U.S. physically and also monitoring of their money transfers. All right. Well, anyway, uh, we have, um, and as I said, uh, our, mem our panelists have to, uh, have to uh, run to their next places. However, uh, whoever is available to, to stick around will answer as many questions as you have, I'm sure. Um, but I do want to thank uh, uh, Congressman Darrell Issa, Congressman Louis Gohmert, uh, Mohammed Kabil, uh, Michael Morgan, uh, Major General Bob Newman, 
Samantha and uh, Herb London. Uh, I do encourage uh, everybody to um, take a look at the London Center's website. This video uh, has been recorded on behalf of the London Center and will be on, the, on our website if you need to refer to it again. Um, with that, I thank everybody for, uh, for coming.